but this is investing. And I, and I think that the folks who are just hitting the button, you're going to lose. And, and there's an entire industry out there hoping that you keep hitting the button. Right. And they built it for, you know, the market makers and HFC guys, the exchanges, this whole infrastructure that we're talking about. They stay in business, by the way. They're going to make money. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with market structure expert Joe Saluzzi. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Joe, in which he explains the invisible arms race occurring every day in the financial markets that seeks to exploit regular investors like you and me, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. Oh, but if you haven't yet, don't forget to subscribe to this channel by clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. It only takes a second and it really helps us out as the more subscribers this channel has, the more big name experts we can attract onto this program in the future. And now here's part two of our interview with Joe Saluzzi. Again, there may be a few traders out there who are excellent traders who know exactly what they're doing, who pick their spots, who use great technicals, have great fundamental analysis, and they trade a lot. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's also a lot of other traders who are coming in based on something that they saw on a message board and somebody else told them to do something and they really don't know and they're just kind of guessing. The guessing will go away. Okay, that's really what shouldn't be in the market because guess when you guess you will lose. Eventually you're going to lose. Yeah, I, I just just as a, a fun anecdote, I had a I had a uh, a really nice guy, early twenties, hadn't gone to college. He was here doing some side jobs at the house. In the three hours that he was here, uh, he must have placed eight trades on his Robinhood app on his phone. Um, and you know, best of luck to him. You know, <laughs> I hope I hope they prove to be winners. But you know, we chatted for a little bit, and that that wasn't a unique thing. He says he trades. I can't remember how many trades he says he does a week. But you know, if that's indicative of the type of person that you're referring to, which I think you you are, you know, the average Joe, um, particularly one that doesn't have a ton of money. Uh, that can afford to lose a ton of their yeah. money uh, to be trading like that is to me just sort of feels like playing with fire. I see you nodding here. Yeah. And I think that's the problem. And I think, you know, apps like Robinhood encourage that style of trading. You know, some people, again, we, they call it gamification. They made it really easy. And there's, you know, confetti that I heard they got rid of the confetti and, you know, things like it's not a game. Right. And, and you know, it's not gambling. It's investing. And I think if you want to gamble, you know, you want to go to a, one of those gambling apps. That's fine. But this is investing. And I, and I think the, the folks who are just hitting the button, you're going to lose. And, and there's an entire industry out there hoping that you keep hitting the button. Right. And they built it. For, you know, the market makers and HFC guys, the exchanges, this whole infrastructure that we're talking about. They stay in business, by the way. They're going to make money. They will always make money because they know what they're doing and they have their risk profiles. So I always you know, I always tell people that they ask me, well, what do you think of the market? What should I be doing? I'm like, don't over trade, you know, and stay invested in the market if you like it. And then you, you're an investor. It's different than a trader. Now, if you're a trader and you really are sophisticated and you've done your homework, I also encourage that. I think it's OK, trade. Let's go. But tell me, if I have two kids and my kids ever ask me, you know, I want to buy a stock. I'm like, OK, first thing, tell me three good reasons. I want three good reasons why you're buying that stock. And then we'll talk from there. And if they go, oh, I read it, I saw it on a Reddit board. I'm like, nope, get rid of it. When yeah, I'm and if one of them is, well, dad, it's going up. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's not a reason. No. No. <laughs> Let's talk fundamentals, I say. Let's talk about where's the growth prospects of this company? Where are the earnings? You know, who's the management? Let's, let's talk real fundamentals. That's what matters. Yeah, okay, great. Um, well, look, I want to move on because I, I, I do want to get pretty quickly to the, uh, the flash crash that just happened in gold uh, over the past uh, weekend. Um, but real quick before we get there, um, you just said two things that I just want to make sure people take away. Uh, one is that um, in many ways, this whole pay for order flow is an idea that was largely pioneered by Bernie Madoff, right? So when you've got you know a, a major financial trend uh, that was instigated by one of the biggest swindlers you know in history, probably not a great sign that it's uh, it's something we should be doing a lot of. Uh, and then secondly, I know you were just taking a finger to the wind estimate, but but if there's a double digit percentage of existing trading that basically serves no real purpose except to take money from the inexperienced and stuff it into a po the pockets of a few big money makers, um, that's just a, a huge uh, you know black mark against the current uh, system that we have in place. And those aren't the only problems. Um, but but those are two pretty big damning ones. Um, okay, so moving on, you mentioned two things I just want to give a little bit of attention to um, before we move on to the flash crash. You talked about dark pools. We've talked a little bit about HFTs. I just want to demystify that for viewers that don't 
aren't completely familiar with what those are. Um, why don't we start with dark pools? Um, let us know what they are. And you made a comment that was interesting. You said, hey, not, not all of them are bad. Um, right. When we hear them, we think, oh, this is activity that that's dark. And, and you know, we hear like black ops in the military, like it kind of <laughs> has this sense of like, yeah. oh, whatever's happening there must not be good. Um, and I'm sure some bad stuff happens there. Uh, net, net, are dark pools good for us? And, and what can you do to demystify? Right. They're, they're, they're trading destinations. So let's, let's talk about that. By the way, the industry shot themselves in the foot when they when they referred to them as dark pools. This was years ago. And the theory was, OK, they're not in the lit. We call it the lit venue. So the, when you see a quote, we, we refer to that as lit. So if it's not lit, it's dark. So all of a sudden they started referring to them as dark pools. There's different types and the actual technical name from our alternative trading systems or ATSs. So every ATS out there has to file with the SEC. This is called a form ATS, which tells you more about what's going on, how they operate, you know, how they segment order flow, how they do things. Okay, so there is a bit of transparency as to the workings of a ATS. Okay, I'm going to continue to refer to it as an ATS. There's different types. Now, I, we trade, for, like I said before, we trade for institutional clients. I trade a lot on various exchanges. I'll trade on the New York. I'll trade on NASDAQ. I'll trade on IEX a lot. And I'll also trade on dark pools slash ATSs. Some of my favorite ones, there's one called Bids. There's another one called LiquidNet. Okay, um, these are let's just call them block trading venues where institutions, our job is to move institutional trades, to move blocks. I'm trying not to get chopped up all day because the more I get chopped up, the more I'm going to get spotted, which means my client's costs are going to go up. So if I can find a slug, as we call it, on the other side, a big trade, I'm going to do it. So if they say, hey, Joe, sell 50,000 shares of XYZ and I find 50 in a dark pool, we're going to put it up and we're going to put a trade to the tape. Now that's like two ships crossing in the night, but it's, it's very difficult to get a trade of that kind of size nowadays because there's so much noise in these venues. Then there are, okay, so those are the bigger ones, but then there are smaller venues. Um, the market makers operate their own venues, okay? The other brokers operate their venues. Some are good, some are noise in our opinion. So as, uh, again, we're, we're a little bit more sophisticated. What we can do is screen out the noise. So I will make sure that my, my order flow never touches what I'll consider a dirty dark pool. It's not going there. Okay, I can control that. I control my own flow. Others don't have that ability. Okay, other institutional traders don't have that ability, which basically means that they're going to get signaling. The more signaling you put, the higher trade cost you're going to be. But but here's an important point about a dark pool. Every time a trade goes up, whether it's 100 shares, 1,000 shares, or 50,000 shares, it hits the consolidated tape. In the United States, we have something called the consolidated tape. They don't have this in Europe, by the way, where every trade that happens instantaneously goes to the tape. And I can see which venue it went up on. So if it went up on the New York, I can see it. If it went up on NASDAQ, if it went up on the dark pool, it goes up in something called an ADF, or an alternative display facility. I can kind of, I know it went off dark, but I don't know which dark pool it went off in. So, but I watch, I watch just like a hawk all day long. The traders over here, we got six traders. We sit there and we watch the consolidated tape to know where the trades are happening, to feel the tape. It's old fashioned what we do. It's really, it's not a scalable model, but it helps us trade. So I take advantage of the flow if I can in the dark pool. I'll try to find it there. The market makers will print every one of their pieces to a dark pool. They will print it to the, not to the, to the, it'll go up on the tape and it'll show up as a non-exchange trade. It's not bad. You know, everyone's saying dark pools are bad, dark pools are bad. It's who's trading in the dark that may be bad. The dark pool didn't do anything. It's who's trading there. That's what you need to distinguish. All right. And, and you know, I think dark pools probably entered our consciousness probably about 10 years ago, uh, I'm guessing. Um, it, it, are, are the dark pools more cleaned up of bad actors these days than they may have been back then? Or is it, is it always been the same? Uh, the systems themselves, about a year or two ago, when the SEC had this call, it was an ATS, an amendment to rule ATS, where they required the dark pools to file these form ATSs, which are brutal to read, by the way. And I've read every single one of them. They're like 30 pages of pure, gory market structure mechanics inside baseball. If, I really, if you want to go to sleep one day, pull up the form ATS for one of these things. But it told <laughs> us a lot. It was really good. I learned a lot about the inner workings of some pools that I didn't really know about. Things called conditional orders, segmentation. They would segment certain flow over others. So did it clean up? Not necessarily. Did they shine a light on them? Yes. And when the light goes on, 
you turn your light on and the roaches are in the house and if the if it's dark the roaches will be around if you turn the light on they scatter well they, when the when the sec turned the light on some of these dark pools i believe some of the roaches scattered and they're not necessarily doing some of the things that they were doing in the past but there's still behavior that goes on there and the sec is their job to police it it's not easy it, it's not easy but you know, it's my job as a trader to make sure I don't get caught up in some of the traps that are being laid for them. Right, right. Um, all right. So dark pools are, um, you know, kind of like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good analogy here, but um, it, it, they can be used for good or evil. Um, hopefully with more light that gets brought into there, they they do more good than evil over, over time. The bad guys will have fewer shadows to hide in. Um, but uh, it's good that we've got professionals like you, you know, trying to figure out, how, watching closely and, and, and trying to, you know, find the right people to work with there. Um, all right, so let's move on to uh, high frequency trading algorithms or HFTs, as we've been mentioning a lot here. Um, so this was a big problem. Um, I don't hear about it in the media as much as I used to. Um, part of that's because pay for performance has taken up so many of the headlines. Um, ha have, they, have they cleaned up a lot of the the greatest successes of the HFTs, or are we just hearing less about them because other new practices are stealing the, the headline ink? Yeah, I think you're just hearing less about them. I don't think they ever went anywhere. Uh, I do think they consolidated, like we were saying before, and they're bigger now. But, you know, payment for order flow is the headline. That's what everybody talks about. But the HFTs are, are still there, and they're very dominant and because they, they trade so much. And high-frequency trading means they trade a lot right? That's what HFT means. So think about this, our arms merchants that we talked about before, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, the SIBO, they rely on their biggest customers to feed the money to pay that are paying for that co-location service that are paying for those data feeds. They need to, when an HFT walks over to one of those exchanges and says, hey, you know what? I would like you to give a higher rebate. If I were to give you more volume, let's say I went up in a higher volume tier, which they call it, can you increase my rebate? And sure enough, you'll see a filing coming through the, the, the rule changes that they want to change. Re and we can talk about rebates in a second. But the HFTs are dominant and they're still out there influencing behavior of these so-called arm merchants and still getting what they want. They're still making their money. They're still shaving a tenth of a penny here. They're still practicing what they call latency arbitrage, where they're able to ping one venue and go faster than another venue. It, it, it hasn't changed. They're underneath the surface. Some will say that they have liquidity. And without them, we would have a really poor market. I would say that they take liquidity as much as they add liquidity, and they're the cause of a lot of movements, a lot of you know mini flash crashes. They're out there, and they have no obligation, no obligation to supply liquidity. They're not market makers. They're proprietary traders who come and go whenever they please, yet they dominate so much. So, you know, is it illegal? No. But is it a force in the market that you have to deal with? Absolutely, they're still there. Okay, so you, you mentioned IEX uh, Investors Exchange. This is run by Brad Katsuyama. He was featured in Michael Lewis's Flash Boys as an example of, of uh, you know, a new type of player who's trying to do things right for the investor. And um, you know, basically, they are uh, being much more transparent uh, and putting sort of some defensive measures in place to make it impossible on their exchange to do some of the things that HFTs do on a lot of the other exchanges. So um, two things. One, um, how are they doing? You know, are, 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 is business going their way? We'd obviously like to see more of the volume happen on, on exchanges that folks can feel better about. Um, and then secondly, uh, th that, that's the, the industry sort of trying to clean itself up. What's happening on the regulatory side? Um, it, it, are there any movements underway to try to diminish the damage that the HFTs are doing to the system, or are they so embedded and so politically and financially connected that they're just going to be here forever, as far as we can tell? Yeah. Uh, for IEX wise, they're doing great. I think they're still doing well. Their market share doesn't really dictate and you know, tell you how well they're doing. So the market share of IEX is between two and 3% per day. Sounds like it's small. But you have to remember, they don't list any stocks, so they're out. They don't get the opening and the closing prints, which is a significant amount of volume going on right now. The intraday volumes there are significant. And I can tell you as a small firm, we're, we're a relatively small institutional broker. Most days, we're trading north of 25% of our volume on IEX. How am I trading 25% yet their market share is two to 3%? Because I'm finding pieces of volume that I'm looking for and I'm not moving the market. 
And here's the problem. Here's the good thing about IEX. They don't offer the co-location services. They don't supply individual proprietary data feeds order by order, which the other ones do. They do it on an aggregated basis, which feel, I feel much more comfortable that no one's going to see me there. And they have the speed bump, which is their classic you know, strategy with them when they originally started. So when I trade on IEX, I don't see the movement and that noise, as we call it, as if I were to put an order on NASDAQ or Denizy or somewhere else. It's just a cleaner way of trading, and I feel much more secure trading my client's order flow there, and I'm getting the results, and we track all this with our trading cost analysis, and it's a, it's a solid venue that's still getting it done. Our institutional clients still love it, and that's where we're getting a significant amount of volume. I wish they were more. They're trying to get into the retail space more. They want that Robin Hood order, that TD Ameritrade order to interface with them because a lot of most here, most IEX uh, orders, a lot of it is midpoint pegs. So there was orders are sitting in the middle of the spread. But we were talking about before, if it's 15 bid offered at 1505, IEX a lot of times has an order in the middle of the spread at 15025, say. So if your broker says, okay, I'm going to sell my order flow to a market maker, he fills you at 15049. Well, he might have done a better job had he checked IEX first and got 15025. But if he did that, he's got to pay IEX a small transaction fee, which would kill his zero commission model. So brokers are incented not to get the best price. How crazy is that? They're incented uh, not to get best execution. They're incented to pad their own pockets first. And that's why payment for order flow is such a bad idea. So if they were to check the midpoints, and some of them are, if there's a commercial actually on interactive brokers during the day, and they say, we've got two models, zero commission, where we send it to market makers, and, or you can pay a small fee and direct your order yourself. Well, that to me is a better deal. I would rather direct my order and pay the fee because I think I can get a better job than because, but I'm a professional trader and this is what I do for a living. But a lot of times my point is there's, there's stock in the midpoint. There might be better liquidity somewhere else, but by you sending it to the market maker, you, you don't know that. You don't know. So there have been studies both ways. They'll tell the market makers will say, I'm wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. We, we provide liquidity. We shrink spreads. And others will say, no, that if you did do that, you could actually find more liquidity in the middle of the spread. So it's an open debate still. I personally think there's a lot more that, you know, if payment for flow wasn't there, you could find better trades for you. So, you know, the, the limit orders would build and so on. Anyway, that's IEX. There's, they're still moving, but go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, well, real quick, um, uh, the regular regulatory side, um, is there anything going on there that's going to give us hope that, uh, you know, they're going to clean things up even further with the HFTs or should we just, uh, just get comfortable with the fact that, that these guys are so connected, they're just going to stay. Yeah. Well, here's a good example. A few years ago, the, uh, the SEC proposed something called a transaction fee pilot. Basically, what we're, the exchanges also have a system where it's payment for order flow, where they charge you, if you take orders, if, you, if, you, if you're a maker on an exchange, they give you a rebate. So if I post liquidity, I get a rebate. If I take liquidity, I pay them. So it's called a maker take a model, right? The SEC a few years back said, eh, this is very distortive. We're not sure about this model. We don't really like it. Let's do a test. Let's do a pilot where we would flatten that out. And they had these different buckets where they said, okay, this is gonna be a no rebate model. This will be a flat fee model. And we're gonna test it, just a pilot, right? Just a pilot, we're gonna test the exchanges and their lobbyists and their, the powerful money behind them fought this thing tooth and nail, sued the SEC. They sued the regulator and quashed it. Basically got it gone, never happened. We couldn't and, even. And, and, and they, were just, they, they were just quashing a test, right? They weren't quashing a, a binding decision, just, just a test. Just a test. Yeah. They weren't changing the rules. We were just testing it. But they knew, the exchanges knew that if this thing went through, it would probably prove the fact that rebates do distort volume, that rebates are costly, and they really shouldn't be there. IEX, by the way, is a flat fee. You pay the same rate if you make or take. That's what we believe is the best model. I'm happy to pay. I believe exchanges provide a service and I'm happy to pay them a tenth of a penny, two tenths of a penny, whatever it would be to make or take them. That's good. But they, they, they play the game with the rebates because the HFTs want the rebates because they know they can make money. For instance, an HFT can buy a stock for $10 and sell it for $10 and still make money. And you're like, wait a second, what are you talking about? You bought and sold it at the same price. Well, they collect a rebate on one side and they maybe get something flat on the other side and they make a half a penny. But you do that millions of times a day. Guess what? You made a ton of money. And that's what the whole model is built on. 
So just to prove the point that hardly the, the wheels of Wall Street regulatory chain, they go very slow. And anytime a, a, an invested party can throw some sand in that wheel, they will, and they will be down in DC telling everybody, guys like me don't know what we're talking about. You don't know what they don't know. This is what, this is good for investors. And it's very difficult to change. However, I'm very excited about Chairman Gensler. He knows what he's doing. He was a CFTC chair. He understands markets. He understands what the problems are. He, I hope you know the exchanges don't get in his ear too much, but they're supposedly uh, preparing a report about what went on in GameStop and AMC earlier in the year, and maybe something comes out of that. You know, we do think that there might be some proposals. Banning payment for order flow would be lovely, but I doubt it's going to happen. Maybe they will tweak it a little. Maybe we'll try the transaction fee pilot again. But, you know, they need to do some, there's certainly issues here that need to be addressed because problems do occur. And then people wonder, well, how did that happen? Well, you never addressed it. All right. Well, depressing to hear your lack of confidence that big changes are, are likely to happen. Optimistic to hear, though, that you um, are optimistic about uh, the new SEC chairman, Gary Gensler. Um, and then you said, you know, sometimes problems happen which get attention. Well, so we just had a problem with a flash crash in the precious metals. Um, and it's interesting you brought up Gensler in his time at the CFTC. This has long predated his time there, but the precious metals market has been certainly apparently uh, vulnerable to raids where the price does get kind of monkey hammered, sometimes with, with really, I think, surprising, maybe even sickening and irritating consistency. Um, <laughs> but this was a true sort of flash crash that happened uh, on Sunday evening as uh, $4 billion worth of, of contracts were sold within minutes uh, right at the Asian market open when you know, markets are pretty thinly traded because America's asleep at that point in time. Um, it's, not, it's something that nobody would do who cared about getting a good price, right? So uh, can you explain what happened and then maybe also opine on how can we let that happen? I mean, it, it just, it, it doesn't seem like something that if, if, if you were running, you know, the system like, like Gensler is now responsible for, you wouldn't want somebody to be able to come and do that and basically weighing the price mm -hmm. of a major world commodity around buy so much in such a small fraction of time. Yeah, that I mean, I, I'm just I don't trade futures myself, so I'm not involved in that market. But when I looked at that afterwards, it looked very similar to the 2010 equity flash crash that we had here. And not only were the charts almost identical on an intraday basis, but the story of the big fund coming through with that large amount of volume. That was the same story that apparently happened on the flash crash, which is still debatable, by the way, how that happened. But what I think happens is if a big, if an imbalance comes through and going back to liquidity in a book, it is extremely fickle and is extremely automated now. It's not limit orders placed by investors like me and you. It's automated algorithms that tend to look at all different markets, that look for all signals. And when a signal comes through that they don't like, they get the hell out of the way. Or even worse, they exacerbate it and get on the other side and really push it down. So when you look at the 2010 flash crash, what I think happened there was orders came through. It set off all sorts of signals. Buyers who happened to be there walked away. And there was one HFT um, reportedly in the press. He said this. He goes, I went to my computer and I typed the ticker. I typed in HF stop, which means get me out. He wiped out his entire book, basically walked away. So that liquidity started to disappear. Others saw that leaning on it a little bit more. And here's the kicker, I think. What happens is once a lot of these stop losses start to move, so people will put a stop loss order in thinking that they're protecting themselves. But a lot of folks didn't realize that the stop loss converts to a market order. If you don't have it as a stop loss limit, you're going to get hurt. So if you put those in, make sure you put a stop loss limit on them. A stop loss market means as soon as my price activates because of a, it sees a price being on the, on the screen, go as a market order and go hit the bid. Well, guess what? If the guys all typed in HF stop, there's no bids to hit. And this is what happened in the flash crash. Stocks that were trading at $50 a share traded at one penny, 0 0.01. How can that be? Because there were no bids. The limit orders basically evaporated and it hunted looking for a bid and it found a bid down at a penny, which was called a stub quote. It basically, everything just, whoosh, it went down that quick. And then sure enough, just as fast as it went down, it started to tick back up. The SEC and the stock market has since then put in what they call limit up, limit down rules, which will try to prevent some of this stuff. They got rid of these so-called stub quotes and you have to have two-sided markets. 
We don't see it as often as we used to, but we still still see many flash crashes out there. So, you know, that's a problem. That's what that, that tells me that the limit order books that we keep talking about are not robust. They're not there. It's filled with algorithms. It's, it's filled with automated traders who are looking for signals. And all they're doing is pinging all day long. And it doesn't matter, 24-7. They're trading crypto during the weekend. They're trading futures in gold at night. They're trading currencies. They trade everything. And that's what they, HFTs don't trade one asset class. They trade them all. And when one asset class signals something, it might signal something to another asset class. And boom, off they go. It has nothing to do with fundamentals anymore. And then the suckers, or not suckers, the, 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 the people who get taken advantage of think something's going on, and really nothing was going on in gold at the time, and choom, off they went, and the next thing you know, they're going back up. Well, so I got I to gotta bring it back to, at the very beginning of this interview, we briefly touched on uh, prices of assets today probably being pretty fairly divorced from fundamentals. So we have liquidity being provided by the Fed and now by Congress uh, that's that's distorting prices upwards, right? So they're not based on fundamentals. We now have a trading system <laughs> that you said can get away from fundamentals as well. Are we setting ourselves up for just some colossal reckoning here where, uh, you know, untethered from fundamentals heading upwards and, and un, uh, you know, driving prices upwards and untethered from fundamentals in terms of how the plumbing operates? Um, can there, can, what's the potential for, you know, some horrendous moment where the two of those just collide. It's there. I'm not going to say it's not. I mean, I, I do think those 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 circuit breakers that are in will stop to an extent. They're even they're market wide circuit breakers that will stop it. It's I think it's seven percent, fifteen percent, so on. But you know, the old saying that the market takes the steps up and the elevator down, right? Well, the elevator could snap and you could free fall. Yes, it could happen. It happens. It happens. Okay, and and it will correct itself, but. You know, I do think, like I said, I think they put some safeguards in place to prevent it from falling 10 floors, maybe. Maybe it'll only fall two floors now and then it'll stop. But yeah, there are a lot of fundamental distortions, right? There's a lot of stuff out there that I don't believe is, you know, I don't think are, but the price is the price. In the end, if why is somebody paying $20 million for a mansion when last year it went for $10 million? The price is the price. The market sets the price. Who am I to say that the markets are given the wrong price? I'm just a trader. I don't know what I'm doing. The market tells me what the price is. That's what I do. I believe in markets. But sometimes markets are influenced, right? And sometimes markets do get out of whack. And you're right. You, you can easily correct. And what's going to cause that correction? You know, all it's going to take probably is some Fed comment, right? And off she goes. And, you know, everyone will get nervous and panic. And maybe it'll be short term. Maybe it won't be. But it, it could easily happen again. But I don't think it's going to be as bad as the flash crash of the original one in 2010 because of those safeguards that they did put in. Okay, good. And, and that was the question I was going to ask. Um, I, I do, I, I'll ask this follow up to it, which is generally what usually gets you is the stuff you don't know you don't know. Um, and so we have these new protections in place, which hopefully they will work when needed. Um, but that that expression about the market taking the stairs on the way up and the elevator on the way down, that's an old expression, right? That goes back to the days when trades were placed by real people in real time. Mm -hmm. Now we have the vast, vast, vast majority of trades being done algorithmically, which literally happens in microseconds, which is makes the time you and I blink our eyes in eon, right? Mm -hmm. So is, is there a danger here that the elevator can drop at a speed way faster than it used to in the old days? Uh, and that if we we find out that all the protections that we we put in place don't work in every scenario, that the advancement and sophistication of the technology could maybe even make this even worse. I mean, you, you well, it would be a fa it, yeah, it'll be a fast drop because it'll go so quick and then it'll, it'll immediately halt. The protections will come in, the circuit breakers will kick, but maybe in the old days it might have taken a few hours to make a move that might now may take a second or less. Right? It will be extremely fast. When it does happen, you won't be able to react. It'll be too late. right? And then you'll be like, okay, we're in a halt mode. What do we do now? We've got 10 minutes, 15 minutes before the next release comes. Then it depends. right? And it's, it's scary. It's scary. When you looked over the cliff and you don't see anything, it's going to cause more people to maybe panic. And then we'll see. We'll see what we're built on them. We'll see what kind of fundamentals are out there. We'll see what you're really made of, right? But <laughs> yeah, it, all right. Uh, well, we're not trying to freak people out. Again, just trying to help people understand 
kind of what the system is. Um, yes. All right, Joe, I, I hate to ask you this question as we wrap up here, um, but it was one that was on my list that I'd love at least your one minute uh, answer to, and we can go in deeper next time you're on. Um, but I think you've got an opinion about whether a Bitcoin ETF will actually ever see the light of day or not. Do you have a prediction there? Uh, I have always been in the no side of that, and I'm still on the no side. I don't think it's going to happen yet. I do think eventually it will, but I think they got a lot of work to do to the main argument that the SEC, the SEC has denied numerous Bitcoin ETF applications. And the main reason is always we don't have any cross surveillance of these different exchanges. In other words, the, the exchanges are not regulated. The spot markets, at least our stock exchanges are regulated. And there's a lot to, a lot of people are watching. There are eyeballs in. The underlying stock, spot markets on the Bitcoin exchanges, which are not regulated. So here's what they're trying to do. The, the industry wants this ETF really bad. You know why? Because they get to arm the hell out of the damn thing. So everybody thinks right. it's a good thing. They're going to, it's going to help the pros, people. The reason why they want a Bitcoin ETF is not to help Mr. Retail, me and you. It's to help the pros arb out the futures against the cash. This is what they do all day. It's a constant arb. And they're going to make a ton of money off this thing. So what they're saying is, hey, guess what? We're going to create an ETF based on Bitcoin futures because the futures are regulated by the CFTC. That should solve your problem, right, Joe? No, because you know what the futures are based off of? the underlying spot market. And it's something called a Bitcoin reference rate, which they develop based on a number of different exchanges. So it's this circular logic. I don't think the SEC is going to buy it. I think they're going to continue to say no until they get a grip on what's going on. They need eyeballs on this underlying. Otherwise, there, there's a problem because the next thing you know, pension funds are going to be putting it in their portfolio. Uh, mutual funds are going to be putting it in and they're going to think it's regulated, but it's not. So I don't have a problem with crypto itself. I like crypto. I think it's, you know, I think it's a very fascinating area. I'm certainly not an expert, but I like to look at it. I think it's really interesting. I think it's great. But when you talk about an ETF, that's a that's a security. Okay. And when you're putting a wrapper, I call it a wrapper around a product like an ETF, well, you better make sure that it's that it's regulated properly. Otherwise, you really shouldn't be putting it out there. So my opinion is no, you're not going to see it certainly by the end of the year. I doubt you'll see it by the end of the next year. But I think the industry needs to do some more work to convince the SEC that, that this is something that they can at least self-regulate. All right. Uh, that makes a ton of sense. And it certainly builds on, you know, wh why do they want to make sure that it's regulated at least close to as much as stocks? Well, for all the reasons we've been talking about for the past hour. Uh, so that makes a ton of sense. Thanks for that. And just to, to help folks understand, when you're talking about the exchanges that the cryptos trade on, you're talking about like Coinbase and Binance and Kraken and, and, and those types of companies, right? Correct. Exactly. All right. And those are, the, those are the ones that feed that reference rate, by the way, a lot of them. Anyway, but yes, exactly. All right. Well, Joe, look, it has been another phenomenal time talking with you. Thanks for giving us so much of your time and so much incredibly useful information about how uh, the you know underpinnings of our, our entire financial markets work. Uh, super fascinating. And uh, you're just always such a, a joy to talk to. You, you, you help regular people understand a very complicated topic well thanks so much for coming on awesome. joe i hope we can have you on again yep thank you for inviting me adam you know i love to share this i love to i'll talk about market structure anytime thank you <laughs> all right well we'll do it again soon thanks joe you got it take care we hope you've enjoyed this excellent discussion with market trader joe saluzzi you know at this point most of you are probably asking yourselves how the heck am i supposed to navigate all these challenges this is yet one more reason why we at Wealthion recommend working with a professional financial advisor who is keyed into the true way these markets operate. If you've already got a good one, great, stick with them. They're hard to find. But if you don't, or would like to hear the counsel of another experienced firm, consider scheduling a no commitment, no strings attached consultation with a financial advisor endorsed by Wealthion. These are the same experts who join me on this program every week. Just go fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. It only takes a couple of seconds and it could just change the trajectory of your financial future. But hey, before you go, please don't forget to hit the like button and then click the subscribe button below if you haven't already, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. It only takes a second and it really does help us out as the more subscribers this channel has, the more big name experts we can attract onto this program in the future. Okay, many thanks for subscribing, folks, and thanks for watching.